Great herds of bison once roamed across North America. Their territory stretched from Washington to Pennsylvania and the Northwest Territories of Canada to northern Mexico. At their peak, an estimated 60 million American bison were thriving. But within the span of a few hundred years, social, economic, and political decisions nearly drove them to extinction. As wild bison numbers declined, both Native American communities and private ranchers established captive herds that would prove critical to bison conservation. And Yellowstone National Park contained the only remaining wild herd of 23 bison. The conservation of wild bison became an important part of Yellowstone's mission and history. Today, several thousand healthy animals live in the park. Bringing this species back from the brink of human-caused extinction was a key pivot point in our complex relationship with what's now our national mammal. And the future of the American bison is still very much in our hands. My name is Carolyn, and I'm a naturalist with the Yellowstone Forever Institute. And today, we're going to talk about Yellowstone's role in bison conservation. Mm -hmm. Just so we're all on the same page, the star of this video is the American bison, whose scientific name is bison bison. There's even a subspecies called bison bison bison. I kid you not. I want to drive the bison point home because over the years, this animal has colloquially become known as the buffalo. So you may know it by that name instead. The Lamar Buffalo Ranch in Yellowstone even contributes to this linguistic confusion. True buffalo are a genetically distinct group of bovines, though. So for scientific precision, I'll be using the term bison throughout this video. The tens of millions of bison that roamed the plains and woodlands of North America were surely majestic. They were well adapted to their environment because they grazed on a variety of grasses, could survive harsh winters, and reproduced relatively quickly. Female bison are sexually mature at about two or three years old and can give birth to one calf every year in ideal conditions. That can lead to some big herds. More than that, bison were and are culturally important to Native American peoples that lived here. These nations survived by hunting game, and bison were big animals that provided plenty of resources. Their hides could be used to make clothes, their bones and horns could be carved into tools, their fat could be used for cooking, and their meat, of course, was an important food source. Historically, Native American peoples didn't have a significant impact on bison populations, in part because they tried not to overhunt. Everything was relatively balanced until European Americans came along. They brought industrialization, weapons, and political decisions that seriously affected anyone and anything living on the land they wanted. The influx of European-American settlers led bison populations to become extirpated or locally extinct in certain areas. By the early 1800s, American bison were gone from Midwestern states like Ohio, Indiana, and Kentucky. As transcontinental railroad construction picked up in the 1860s, those workers had to eat, and bison meat made for a convenient meal. Trappers were also interested in bison for economic reasons. Beaver populations were gradually being depleted, but the demand for pelts and leather goods only grew. Bison were abundant, had had big hides, and were pretty easy pickings. These factors led to a dent in the bison population, around a couple hundred thousand deaths per year. Now, that sounds like a lot, but when there were tens of millions of bison, it wasn't too significant, at least for a couple years. By the time the 1870s rolled around and the Transcontinental Railroad was established, things took a turn for the worse. This was basically the final nail in the American bison's coffin. A huge part of the problem was the skyrocketing commercial interest in bison hides. The proliferation of commercial tanning meant that companies wanted more animal hides to turn into leather, and bison hides fetched a good price. Even some Native American nations, such as the Mandan, were incentivized to hunt lots of bison for their pelts because of the high demand of European American markets. Not only that, but bison bones were hot commodities too. When they were ground up, they could be used as bone meal fertilizer, a source of phosphorus, which plants need to grow. Or they could be turned into bone char, which was used as part of a filtration process to refine sugar. In many cases, bison bones littered the landscape, and poorer European-American settlers or Native American peoples collected them in a practice called bone picking. Another huge factor in the American bison's downfall was a combination of political and military interests. Even though it was never official policy, the U.S. government encouraged bison hunting because it depleted a crucial resource that many Native American nations needed to survive. That meant more control over those nations. And the U.S. government wanted control to end the so-called Indian Wars and claim victory. At the time, there was a consistent military presence that aimed to suppress Native Americans by fighting battles against them 
and also slaughtering bison. But the bulk of the hunting came from those private groups, like hunters interested in making a quick buck from bison hides. There were also many wealthy European-American people traveling west and hunting bison for sport, not even using the bodies. Ultimately, from around 1872 to 1874, an estimated average of 5,000 bison were killed each day, decimating the population by millions every year. The Indian Wars ended, and in the process, Native American nations lost a significant amount of autonomy. As they were sequestered to reservations, they retained sovereignty but lost land as well as cultural relationships to the environment and between nations. And many Native American peoples were forced to depend on European American traders or the U.S. government for food and supplies. By 1884, a meager 325 wild bison were estimated to be left in the United States, including around 25 in Yellowstone National Park. And around that time, our understanding of the value of bison was really beginning to shift. Understandably, many Native American communities were some of the first to try to counteract this huge overhunting problem. For instance, in the 1870s, there was a Ponderé man named Walking Coyote, also known as Samuel Wells. He captured four bison calves from the northern herd, the group of bison in the Great Plains north of the new railroads. Several years later, when the herd numbered 13 animals, he sold them to two other Native American ranchers named Charles Allard and Michelle Pablo. The Pablo Allard bison herd grew to become one of the biggest private herds in the United States. By 1896, it contained around 300 bison, and some of them were used to supplement the federal Yellowstone herd, but more on that in a bit. Unlike many privately owned herds, the Pablo Allard bison didn't breed with cattle and produce hybrid offspring. That's important to conservationists, who are often trying to preserve the wild species' genetic information. Meanwhile, a few other private ranchers were building up herds of their own, which helped prevent bison from going totally extinct. And scientists were paying attention, too. In 1889, a zoologist named William Hornaday published a text called The Extermination of the American Bison. That helped create public awareness and support for conservation, including from the federal government. Also of note, the Lacey Act of 1894 outlawed animal hunting in Yellowstone National Park, largely because of the actions of an infamous poacher. So that made Yellowstone the perfect spot for the U.S. government to support a federal herd. In 1902, Congress bought 21 bison from private owners for $15,000, 18 of which came from the Pablo Allard herd. These bison were held for a few years near Mammoth Hot Springs, then they were moved to the Lamar Valley in 1907, and the Lamar Buffalo Ranch was created. Raising these bison was a lot of work. Conservationists had to maintain a good environment full of tasty grasses in the Lamar Valley, Plus, they had to grow and cut hay to feed the bison during the winter. But during this time, the park also contained that wild herd of bison that was never extirpated. That group hit a low of around 23 animals, but they were alive and well. A few were even captured to help with breeding efforts to grow the federal herd. Gradually, all the captive bison were released and assimilated with the free-roaming animals. As one big, happy herd, they continued repopulating. By 1954, there were roughly 1,300 of these bison, which genetically reflected the wild bison that once roamed across the country. It's not a ton of animals, but it's a lot compared to how eradicated the population was less than a century previously. And over the last decade or so, the Yellowstone bison herd has averaged around 4,500 animals. Bison conservation has come a long way, but it still faces many challenges. As of 2008 estimates, there are around 20,500 bison in 62 public conservation herds across the United States and Canada, but those herds span just a tiny fraction of their historic range. Only about 8,000 of those bison, at least half of which are in Yellowstone, are allowed to freely roam across wide landscapes. To support more bison conservation efforts like these, we need to restore the Great Plains to make them a hospitable place to roam again, much like the work done in the Lamar Valley in the early 1900s. We'll never be back to 60 million bison, but bringing the American bison back from the brink of almost certain extinction is a pretty big win. Thanks to the National Bison Legacy Act in 2016, the American bison is now the national mammal of the United States. And the Yellowstone bison herd is so successful that it's considered to be a foundation herd. In other words, as this herd grows, the hope is that they may supplement other federal herds. Bison are an ecologically and culturally significant mammal. They once were something to hunt, tame, or use as a tool in economic or political endeavors, but now we value bison enough to protect them. And restoring their numbers also means restoring the wilderness of this continent that we once actively suppressed. Thanks for watching this episode of Discover Yellowstone. If you want to learn more about our programs and how you can support the amazing world of Yellowstone National Park, 
Visit us at yellowstone.org. And when you come to Yellowstone, you should consider taking one of our field seminars, which are based at the historic Lamar Buffalo Ranch. Through them, you can learn more about bison and many other amazing wildlife species. (music) 